The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they went and saw where Jesus was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Kephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. The call of the disciple of the apostles and the gospels seems artificial and contrived. Despite some differences in the individual gospels, the apostles give up everything to answer a call from someone they have just met. It seems very unlikely as a journalistic account, but it very accurately describes if not the moment when the call is first heard, but the moment when it is understood. I can relate this to myself and can also see it in the life of Martin Luther King. But with him, there is one enormous difference. The apostles were the first leaders of the church, but we see them today as disciples, followers of Jesus just like the rest of us. They were not of the poorest class. Peter and Andrew seemed to be rather prosperous, and some may have been better educated than the average Jew. We see in today's gospel that the immediate group had some connection with John the baptizer. So they were knowledgeable and interested in religion. Being a disciple of a famous rabbi would have allowed a social and more, most likely financial improvement. Yet there was significant risk. Jesus' message was as strange then as now. There is a kingdom coming, but it will not be brought by war and power, but by love and nonviolence. No matter when or how a person hears this, realizing what it really means is always a revelation and requires a firm decision. Today we read the apostles, yes. Now, I was born in a time and place where even the dogs and cats were Catholic. The church was the center of our lives. It was natural for a young man to be attracted to the priesthood. It made it easier because the priests and sisters in my parish were outstandingly good people. When my dad was dying, I was about 12, they would take turns driving my mom and me to the hospital to see him. When I was in seminary high school, the pastor would take me to dinner a few times a year but always on the way we would visit somebody in a hospital or a nursing home. He made it seem the natural thing to do. Yet with all these signs of charity, I also realized that the priesthood at that time was a high status profession and an opening to the good life. Now notice that I am not directly speaking today about a vocation to the priesthood as such, but an acceptance of discipleship. 
That occurred after ordination, when I had to ask what kind of priest I wanted to be. My yes was to follow the examples of the priests and the sisters of my youth. Martin Luther King was born into a prominent ministerial family. He attended the best schools and secured a very well-paid pulpit in Birmingham, Alabama. He planned to do this for a while, then find a teaching position in a major city. This was the path of many successful preachers before and after him. Although he had gone through a period of unorthodox theological beliefs in his youth, he was now secure in his faith and prepared for a successful, if unexciting, career. Then he was called to be a disciple in the fullest sense. He became the leader of the Birmingham boycott because he had polished and was too new in the area to have, been, to have alienated either the white or the black power structures. Everyone thought they could outmaneuver him. Despite his youth, he proved politically very savvy. He was also spiritually sophisticated and very soon realized that this would not be something to burnish his resume, but a true acceptance of God's call. He also knew it was accepting a death sentence. Now, I would not have written that a year ago. I would have made the analogy to the apostles who recognized over time that following Jesus would be following him to the cross. Yet looking at the division and hate in our country, I now think he knew within months, certainly by the time they blew up his home, that he would be martyred. But a few days ago, barbarian hordes rampaged through our capital with murder on their lips and nooses on their hips. The depth of their hatred may have surprised us, but these were emotions that Martin Luther King would have observed from childhood, and he could see where they would lead. Yet from the very beginning until the bitter end, he preached nonviolence. How extraordinary. He preached and in so many ways accomplished loving the people who eventually killed him. How many of us could do that? Yet would not our lives be happier and more fulfilled if we could? God is love, and he made the world out of love. Human love is effectively seeking the good of the other. When we love, especially those who do not return it, we are righteous in the strict, literal, biblical sense. We are in a right relationship with God. When we do not, no matter what else we do or don't do, we are out of harmony with him. We can easily forget that Martin Luther King was Dr. Martin Luther King. The doctorate was an earned degree in philosophy from Boston University. When he said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, he was making a philosophical statement. It may have political effects, but it was more than a strategy, however successful, but an affirmation of the created order. This is simply the way the world is. To love our enemies is the most difficult task, but it is the one that binds us closest to God and the way he created the universe. We need to see this not as a ticket to heaven sometime in the future, but a means of earthly happiness here and now. For happiness is attainable here and now only if we live in conformity to the, wor uh, to the word of God. To make love the center of our life, whether in ancient Palestine, 20th century Alabama, or 21st century Brooklyn, 
is not only to know what is right, but to hear the call of the one who made itself.